Yo, this is Alup. You got a pretty big balls to watch Torian's YouTube videos. When you're done with your snacks, I know when I am, you're going to need a delicious drink to blast away the aftertaste. But don't malt, I mean mald. If you're on the hunt uh, for the best energy formula, try Gamer Subs. You can save 10% on any order on the website using my code Thorin, T-H-O-R-A-N, and keep some of your money, uh, money, money, you can keep some of your money. Get some free samples, by the way. You're not even nicking them or necoing them, whatever, however you would force that one. That's actually a pretty tough one to force, isn't it? It'll give you the energy to make you feel like a Tasmanian devil. Remember that old cartoon? And it's sugar-free, but tastes great. So you'll feel like you're cheating, but getting away with it. Now, I could have changed the hook, you see, but I thought that was fire. So no reason to stew and complain. Now, G2 won the Blast Fall Finals 2024. The first trophy with this new lineup. They had previously, if you remember out the gate, made the final of EWC, even though that was obviously a nonsense fucking tournament. Just had loads of prize money. Remember, go and look at what the group stage was like for that. But the problem is they followed that up with only being top six at IAM Cologne. And quite frankly, if you go there, the way that they lost that like round of six match, was mega underwhelming. It was just the Monacy show again. They were top four at ESL Pro League season 20, but Navi got them there. As usual, obviously it's going to be, the whole video is going to be about them fucking Navi getting them, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. That's all the results. Like the title they had that people are remembering was IAM Dallas, but that was before the player break. And so that was when they didn't have snacks. Chance to be a fine thing, but they had Stewie Two K handing in, standing in for Hooksy, but then Nico IGL'd, if you remember. Now, in the group stage of this tournament, they basically were very likely to make the playoffs, which wasn't in the Royal Arena, as everyone had to stress one billion times and then pretend the new place they're in was sick. But because the blast format is so forgiving, remember, three out of the four teams in the group make the playoffs. Only the last player's team who wins no games basically fails to make the playoffs. Well, because they had Falcons, that was basically like a free playoffs, wasn't it? Now, they didn't even have to have play them. They beat FaZe. That's actually a typical result, actually, bizarrely. Ever since Nico's been in G2 and Carrigan's been in FaZe, actually, G2 just typically tends to beat FaZe with any lineups for some reason. I think in this era, it's because not only do they have a lot of skill, they're actually more skilled than FaZe right now, but they also I think they have a good veto into them and always have pretty much. They lost their pick of Vertigo, which was a little bit concerning in that match, but it didn't matter. Monacy was just smurfing on G2, which was FaZe's pick. They actually, they are just clearly a better team than FaZe right now. FaZe isn't even really quite on the dark horse level that they used to be. That's the problem. They can make series really close and against underdogs, they can still do like the comeback and all that crazy stuff, but we're still waiting to really see the FaZe that we want to see with like Rops at peak level, etc. They lost to Na'Vi in the group stage, not the final, in the group stage, which is like the ninth time in a row they've lost them, which is bonkers, which means, by the way, Alexi B, if you were keeping track, kept that ridiculous, uh, not a streak, but record going where it was whatever it was, like 28 and t 3 or something, or 2 at that point in time. Now, obviously, he lost to the um, G2 in the final, so that will have gone to three or four or whatever for losses. Remember, I did that video about um, Alexi B versus his former teams, just like actually in the past, Carrigan against his former teams has been sick, but that was something more in the past. And obviously, he was never in G2, so it doesn't apply to this match. Um, when they lost to Na'Vi, they actually got 2 0 this time, which was really disturbing because normally they always get a map, normally they can make it close, but this time it's got swept. They even in the veto did quite an interesting gamble, which is they know Na'Vi's always going to be the team to veto Vertigo. So they didn't have to do it themselves. So what they did is they actually took out Mirage in the veto, thinking, well, that's like their best map. And it is. It's Imma's best map. And you would think that would actually make it like a close 2-1 again, or maybe this time 2-1 to G2, but actually this time Na'Vi 2 0 and Na'Vi picked Ancient into them, which shows how things have changed, by the way, since that major, because that was the time when Na'Vi used to be a bit sus, and they used to have like, what, like a 36% win rate on Ancient or something now. So now they've absolutely turned it around, and you can see they can fucking smurf on that map. Wonderful actually did, for real, out gone Monacy. If you even go and look at the head-to-head, -head, he had like 10 kills against him, whereas Monacy had three. So it was kind of an off game. And then the guy no one talks about in that match is Malbs actually had a pretty bad game then. He was like minus 13 or something in that one. That was kind of one way he struggled. So they get to the playoffs, but you're thinking, I mean, they've had a close game against FaZe. He's got two zero zipped up by an RV. They're not winning this tournament, right? You look who else is in the tournament. You've got... Navi themselves who were the favourites to win you've got Vitality he was very very dangerous you've got Zewu obviously he was smurfing the group stage as per usual and then you had Spirit lurking maybe they get it together maybe Don Kachiro Goham maybe they're going to win right they played Spirit in the round of six and by the way they had easily the hardest bracket in fact their bracket meant if they'd won the tournament which they did they had a mega legit run 
because they were playing at Spirit in the round of six. Obviously, a top-ranked team, a team that's won tournaments in recent memory and made deep runs. They won the Bet Boom Dacia Belgrade 2, if you remember. That's obviously a rematch from IM Cologne, where G2 notoriously Giga 2-0 clapped Spirit and made them look like absolute shit and go out last place in the main event. This time around, Spirit actually did um, a just two pick. They didn't do the nuke pick, which I think is should be their home pick against most teams, including against G2. Probably because they were scared of what happened at Cologne. Remember, that was one where Hunter just went fucking ham around the door areas on CT side, and they couldn't get anything going after the first five to six T rounds. Monacy and Nico carried the game pretty much. So it was actually the Star Rifle and Star Orper of G2 going off, not on the side of uh, Spirit. And then obviously the big narrative was Donk, who remember is a rookie playing as Nico, the most veteran superstar rifler, greatest of all time, probably in Counter Strike. Although obviously I'll shout out people like Neo in 1.6. Um, the problem is Donk has directly struggled against Nico. It's kind of fitting, right? That like the most legendary rifler ever is like the final boss for Donk. The guy who's probably going to go down as the best rifler ever in Counter-Strike. It's kind of a cool angle, right? And absolutely Nico again did in the head-to-head -head and in the series carry and dominate Donk, whereas Donk struggled and couldn't get it going entirely. In the semis, so it's, by the way, another great win there. In the semis, they played Vitality. I thought Vitality would win this one. I thought it was even possible for a 2-0 if you look at the veto. It was a very close game overall. Like, absolutely, it could have gone both ways. J2 picked Anubis, which I think is such a ballsy pick, but what a fucking crazy pick. Because I'll tell you right now, I think Vitality is the best Anubis team in the world. By the way, little secret sidebar, I think the second best Anubis team in the world is actually Team Liquid, believe it or not. I mean, they almost beat Vitality on it recently. Maybe they even should have because little side deals isn't a video about Team Liquid. But the reason why Team Liquid is so good on that map is not only does Ultimate just do these crazy aggressive pushes on CT side that somehow no one's punishing at the moment. No one else does them either. But then also NAF is just a fucking monster on that map. So they just have so much fucking control and feel for where people are going to be. This time around, they won Dust 2 heavily, and the decider was, um, so um, Vitality won Anubis, that's why I think it was a weird pick. The decider was Mirage. Now on paper, I would have said this is why Vitality wins the series, because I actually think Vitality, I actually think they're better than Na'Vi or Mirage. I'd like to see them play Na'Vi again on it. I think they're the best Mirage team in, in the world, or if Na'Vi's the best, they're the second best. You could do it that way too. Maybe they're the second best. I don't know. I think if they head-to-head -head played a lot, they'd win, but that doesn't necessarily make you the best, I guess. And also losing here shows maybe you're not the best. Na'Vi is still pretty straight fire. It's really hard to beat them on it, right? You, it's, it's hard to ever get them to not have double digits when they even lose, right? Yeah, it's also the game, the Mirage game, where yes, Nico did the almost most amazing round of CS2 with the 1v5 in regulation and then sadly lost it against bloody Apex of all people who didn't even look by the way like he instantly killed him he looked at like he was whiffing and <laughs> a bit nervous himself and then because he slammed the table he had that blood on his hand first of all I won't make a whole video I bet someone like Richard will probably make one about this but I thought it was fucking insane that people were saying to Yanko, you are getting mad at Holzerk slamming the desk, but then you are thinking it is cool that Nico does it. What is it about stupid people? Well, I'll explain it. That makes them give false equivalences that aren't at all the same principle or situation and go, that is the same. So you are a piece of shit with double standards, right? Let's check the difference there. I know what it is, but I'll explain the mechanism. What they do is, because they're stupid, they can't understand complex ideas. So they make every idea simple. And then when the idea is simple, the answer seems simple. So they go, huh, I figured it out. And they haven't figured it out. They weren't capable of figuring it out or even comprehending the question or the situation. So what happens is their brain doesn't go, right? Halzerk, who's an AWPA who whiffs just average shots in normal games, even in group stages, and then bashes the desk like he's actually fucking monacy and should have hit every fucking AWP shot. Uh, that's not considered like a negative, even though he's just doing it as a, like, he's just playing like a bomb. But Nico, one of the greatest players in the world, maybe the best rifler in the world, when he almost wins, like, the round of the fucking year, in a massive match, by the way, where he's trying to, like, win and get some wins on the way out the door with G2, when he doesn't win it, and he kind of, like, he kind of just fluffed it at the end, when he then gets angry once and slams the table, that's exactly the same as Halsuk doing that. There's no difference between those scenarios because some people are mentally ill or just extremely low IQ. I'll allow for that possibility too. So obviously, by the way, as well, I might do some content about this later. Like, that shouldn't be like... <laughs> 
obviously it isn't the round of the year anymore when he loses it, is it? And look, it was fun. It was kind of cool that it's like, oh, my joke was he he obviously after that round losing it, he realised even his skills couldn't win the game against Vitality. So he made an offering to Corn, didn't he? Now, if you don't know that reference, shut the fuck up. Um, but he did come back later and like, I mean, people said he redeemed himself. He doesn't have to win 1v5s, fuck's sake. Why does he need redemption? So he did win that like key, like 1vx later on in the overtime game, which pushed them towards the end. That was pretty much, if you look at the Dust 2, when you look at the Mirage, it was the Nico Malp show. It was aggressive rifle player that was winning them the game. Zewu didn't wake up on CT side, so unfortunately he did cook on T side and he did have some rounds on Mirage where he looked really good. But, he just didn't get it going. This is one of the problems with Zewu, by the way. Everyone loves to mega scrutinise fucking Donk. A guy who hasn't even played a full year at Tier 1 yet and act like he's supposed to carry every game he loses. But then what's bizarre is Zewu's allowed to post like the most insane HL TV ratings in the group stage. He's definitely going to be MVP. And then in the games they lose, he's allowed to just go, you know, like plus six or something and just have like fucking games where he does nothing. Sometimes even your map pick, he's just bing chilling. That's just okay. He's allowed to be what, like five, six years deep in his career doing shit like that. And then you're still going to tell me, well, not even in CSGO anymore, but he's just the goat of every game he plays. Like, fuck out of here. You, are, you, that's the double standard. You don't even fucking want to actually evaluate him as the greatest player ever. The second he has failure. So to me, I actually thought that was a rough one for Vitality. Massive character win for G2 though. To win that game will actually make you think we can beat anyone. If we go win that game, why can't we just beat everyone in this tournament? Now the problem was they were playing Na'Vi in the final, right? You could argue for Na'Vi, that's the dream. I actually think it would have been way worse for Na'Vi to play particularly against Vitality. We could even argue historically against Spirit, right? But I think actually Vitality, in a best of five, it would be incredibly hard to beat them. And obviously, Na'Vi didn't win this best of five anyway. Remember, Alexi B and Na'Vi do have that issue in best of five finals. Now, look, in the past, it was often because they were underdogs. Now they're on paper, the favourites. But I've told you, their map pool can get tested. Yeah, they're clutch, but that's hard to pull off for of fucking three to five maps. And also... Like, now I actually do sort of believe in the firepower within this system. I'm still giving massive credit to Blade and how Alexi B call. But you play someone like Vitality, they just have more skilled players, mate. They will get you if you give them a full best of five. So I thought they actually should have been happy to get G2. Obviously, they beat them nine times in a row. Now, miss me with everyone who does that thing of like, well, since they won nine times in a row, surely eventually, like, the other team will win. No, that's not how analysis works. Like, it's not flipping a coin. That's not at all how this works. And also, spoiler, when you flip a coin, actually, it's still 50-50 odds every time you flip it. It doesn't matter that nine times in a row it was tails. That's actually, by the way, one of the most famous confidence tricks that people do to people in bars to rip them off. Yeah, you flip a coin, and what you have to do is do this many times until you get somewhere where when you flip it, say like seven times in a row, it goes one side. And then what you do is you say to them, I bet you, and you just bet the odds that aren't 50-50, that it will be the other one next time. And then when they bet, they've just fucked themselves in the long run because of it. it's still 50-50 odds for you, isn't it? Just a little random thing there. Now, in this final, the first interesting thing for me was G2 didn't take out Mirage this time, which I think is so bizarre. I know they got 2 0 in the group stage, but I thought that was like, I don't know about that one. Because the problem I have is you, G2 for me wasn't going to win Mirage against this team. Like, this t that is the, not only their home map, their comfort map, but if you look where they were picking it, they were picking it third, guys. When the map, when Mirage comes third, that means Na'Vi can't be 3 0 without losing the map that they're fucking unbelievable on. And, spoiler, it's Check's Notes Emma's best map and always has been. It's the one that he did those masterpieces on at Blast Paris Major. That's the map that is just his map, bro. Why are you going to let him get in the game? Remember, you go to things like Nuke, he doesn't like that. He gets uncomfortable. You go to some of the other maps, he can be up and down. That's just one of those weird decisions for, I don't know, Taz, Snacks, who the fuck knows who makes the vetoes in that team, mate. Now, I also think that could have been costly. You're moving Anubis instead of Mirage, but it didn't matter anyway. The reason it could have been costly was you gave Na'Vi potentially their three best maps. What, like... Um, Ancient, Dust2, and Mirage in the first three maps of the final. That's how you get 3 0 by the way. I did this whole thing on stream when I was doing my um, explanation of why I was picking... Um, 
Navi to go 3-1 instead of 3-0. And basically, I think a lot of coaches don't try to front load a best of five with their absolute best maps because they worry they'll start slow on the first map or they get upset on the first map or on stage, they get jitters, etc. So they kind of want to put their best maps to the middle. And sometimes some of them even like to save one till the end. You can see sometimes people do this in BL3 as like an insurance policy in things, case things go wrong or get a bit hairy early on. I hate that mentality. I think it's actually a loser's mentality. I think a winner's mentality is actually, if it'd be Navi doing it, to front load the veto like this. So you just get your best maps at the beginning and then it's the other way around. You try to go 2-0 against them and then have a strong map as the third and then their confidence just shot. They psychologically break and then you can just win 3-0 because they're thinking, oh, but you have to win three maps to come back from this and it's a map that's good for them. That's what you want to do psychologically to your opponent. But actually in this scenario, it was Navi that got those maps. But we're going to do a video about this one day. Navi clearly has problems in BO5s. I'll go and do it. Like if actually the final of majors, I mean, obviously Colonia kind of eats it is. If the final majors would be BO5, that would make me think it's less likely that Navi wins the next major. But as long as it's BO3, they can cook anyone in BO3. We've seen that already. Now, G2 won out Ancient first, even though part of the reason why for me is one of the people I want to do some serious work on that map is Bit from Navi. I think him being really smart is massive to stopping the T's just being able to pick you apart. I thought he kind of shit the bed on that one. Dust 2 was very close, but the stars of G2, Monacy and Nico were performing. They got the win. By the way, Navi's really good on that map. Monacy almost got the Mirage. He almost did 3-0 the series, but the problem is that is him as map. You allowed him to come alive and he came alive. Now, on Inferno, remember, I've always told you, I was never actually sold on Inferno, even when Na'Vi won the major, especially not, and then even when they won EWC. I always told you, that looks like a map they can be beaten on by a bunch of the elite teams. And, famously, it took very big, either GL or especially bit performances, like insane performances you can't just do every time to win. And that's why, actually, the win rate for Mirage has tended to be like 40 to 60% for Na'Vi, even during some of the periods of their success and even when they won majors and massive tournaments, etc. Now, that is one also where, if you remember, they almost lost that to Mouse when they were at um, IM Cologne. That was a, They were in a bad situation on that map. Yes, T Alexi B can call a great T-side. That is one of the maps I think is a little bit worse for them, not least because... Obviously, it's more inhibitive to the opera, isn't it? And if you saw in this game, wonderful, and by the way, was having a fabulous tournament, probably would have been the MVP for Na'Vi, actually did struggle on that map. That was one that looked like it neutralised him a bit. Imma also struggled. That's also been a map where sometimes he's a little bit sus. That's why people just can't fucking do the analysis or the coaching homework. If you go and look the whole time in Na'Vi, they're not just gods who frag out on every map. There are certain maps certain players play way better on, and then they play like 70% as good on some of the other maps, and you can get those maps as your decider or your pick. People just aren't going and looking and looking at what type of team do I have, what type of team does Na'Vi have, and then which map should I go to? They're just doing things like, well, I'm comfortable on this map, though. They're not good on that map by win rate. Like, that's not how you veto. I don't care that these people are pros and some of the best player coaches in the world, blah, blah, blah. That's not a thing they focus on, guys. I've talked to these guys so many hours. They sometimes don't even do the extra research of how I do it. We do like the last 15 series they did. You look at the conditions. You try and do a flow chart of why they second veto or something, why they punish pick against certain teams. You try and guess their psychology from the style of IGL and play. They're just doing shit off feel and scrims and last time we played them and the last demo we watched, for fuck's sake. I did think on the Inferno game, Malps had a big, big performance. That's part of why it wasn't actually five maps. Would have been interesting if it had been. Monacy obviously won that 1v2 at the end. Almost didn't defuse, which was hilarious. He did the classic way, stood up and actually forgot to defuse. If people don't know, the worst example ever of like, a guy who forgot to defuse, but in this case, it wasn't a forgetful thing. It was the team celebrating because you won the game off the defuse. Is that classic one someone showed on uh, Twitter when I reminded them of it, where like Crystal... The old German IGL, but I think he was just an opera back then. Won like a 1VX. And then as he was diffusing, his coach like shook his back or something to celebrate. And then it made his like finger come off the diffuse and they failed the diffuse. I think, I can't remember if they lost the game. I doubt it. I doubt they'll be like the losing game round. But I know it did actually cost them that round. Now, Na'Vi obviously has an issue in finals, but best of five finals. But we can get to that in another video, can't we? As I said before, I think this was a very legit win. Because you played FaZe in the group stages, they're not terrible. You played Na'Vi in the group stages, the best of three. That can be a final at the majors. You played Spirit and beat them in the playoffs. Nice shit. You played Vitality in a full best of three and beat them, included on Mirage. That's fucking fire, by the way. And then you beat Na'Vi. Not only did you beat them finally, you beat them in a final and you beat them in a best of five and it didn't even take five maps. Like, I thought that was very, very impressive. Now, yeah, there was a bunch of close games in there. Like, by the way, there's a world where... Um, they lose to Vitality, 
maybe they could even have lost to Navi. I think it could have been 3-1 the other way. It could even have been 3-0, obviously, if Navi had their shit together. Uh, but you won the games. This time you won. Monacy was rightfully the MVP. It's why I keep saying, like, when I look at Donk play, now this is what you need to understand. There's a difference between what you're seeing on the screen and how you think about someone and how you place a hierarchy and what things you prioritize. When I watch Donk play with my eyes, there is no reason he should be considered number two, number three player in the world. Like I watch him play when he's on his game, most of the time, by the way, 99% of the time, and he looks so good. It's like there, there isn't a player better than that. But then also, when I watch Monacy, I also think a similar thing and for different reasons. Like Monacy has this clutch factor to his game. Obviously, he does get to come late, whereas Donk doesn't. And the way he sort of puts himself around the map in big games sometimes, I, it is simple-esque. I like the way he sort of goes for it and he sort of knows when there's some weaknesses and overloads a certain spot or takes a super aggressive peak when he knows that like we can't hold the site against these people or on T-side he, he's willing to just take fights that other people just frankly are not willing to do with the op so I think Monacy this is why for me I think he's probably going to end as my number one for the year I'm probably going to go Monacy 1 Donk 2 Zero th Zibu 3 depends if Zibu can win the major and be the MVP etc if you look at the numbers they were really good but they weren't as insane as you probably realise like this wasn't one where not, oh, Hunter had a great tournament Monacy was sick he had a very high rating he probably should have won uh, the MVP there it would have been wonderful for Navi otherwise he was on a very good tournament. Nico was very, very good, especially for a rifler. Like, he is contesting Donk for best rifler in the world. I guess you can say Zewu is a bit as well, but he started up in more now, so now he's more just like the hybrid, more almost like a 50-50 player now. Malbs was pretty good, but this wasn't his best tournament. That was probably Cologne, by the way, even though the playoffs wasn't as good. Just the volume there, playing against some big-name teams, etc. The key thing about Malbs is this. He is a sensation on T-side. Like, he absolutely can just run in and decapitate someone with a, a one bullet to the head from an AK, which is why a lot of people don't really believe in Snacks' T-sides. They think it's just like, wait, mate, you've got like Monacy, Nico, and Snacks, uh, and fucking uh, Malbs just running in and shooting people. Like, what was the strat, though? But... I actually have some content coming on that soon with a former coach of Snacks is where he does have some interesting takes about how Snacks calls that might actually add a little bit of nuance to what people think of him. I still think he frags like shit and he overall, I don't see that much brilliance overall from the calling personally. I do think Malbs drops off against top teams, understandably. And by the way, actually, traditionally, he had issues against Narvi. So this was maybe even a, a statement game for him that he had such a good performance in the final, especially the last map of the final, by the way. I do think also... It's so silly that people just look at his rating or his scores or his frags and they go, ha ha, what about all the role cells who said that on CT side, he'd have way less impact as an anchor and he wouldn't be able to be a star player. If you don't know, I think his average rating on CT side is 1.05, which is not star numbers. And remember, in CS2, you'd think on CT side, you could just farm if you're a really skilled player. Loads of top players do it. So actually, he himself even said in an interview, he gets a bit bored on CT side. It's clear to me, he could actually be a much better player. He could probably be a Hitchell TV top 10 player if he actually played his what he wanted to do on CT side. So spoiler, even though people are crying and malding right now about Nico can leave G2, bearing in mind there's a world where not only Nico leaves, but Monacy leaves too, maybe not even for the same team. I think when they then rebuild the team around Hunter, I mean, who knows if Snacks is there, and Malbs, then you just put Malbs in all the star rifle spots he wants to be in. Now you can start to cook. Now you could have a top 10 player, which look, you can't really replace Nico, but it's about maybe the best you can do at the moment if you got him, his numbers up on CT side for Malps. Hunter actually thought played like shit at this tournament. I don't know what's going on with that guy, especially because I've heard he has so much sort of sway within the team and with the GM and stuff. Like, I think that's whack as fuck because this guy, I think this year has generally played like a bomb. He's had a bunch of tournaments since the player break and they did the snacks change where he sort of like upped his numbers and had some big games, notably that spirit one I mentioned before. But he also has times he just goes completely missing completely. And he doesn't even always win those 1VXs he used to know him so famously for last year in CSGO. Snacks frags like absolute fucking ass. Like, he's one of those people where, don't even look at the rating, look at the KD. Oh my God, this guy is as bad as a fragger. Because he doesn't just take all the shit rolls and put himself in the worst spot ever. Like, he clearly sometimes takes fights he wants to take. But the problem is, because he's won this tournament, and because he won that 1v2 on Mirage, people are actually going to act like that automatically makes him better than Huxley. It means Huxley couldn't do that with this team. And that means, like, he's vindicated and he was definitely right and all the jack. Oh, give me a break. You won a fucking Blast Banana Cup, mate. That's all you've won. I don't actually think this team will win any other tournaments. So I will give maybe in the future a video about Snacks' eye gelling. 
I also will say, I think I've heard he does make some calls or some reads. I think part of it is Nico and Monacy don't want loads of structure, in my opinion. They kind of can take initiative themselves. So as long as you sort of tell Malbs when to run in and then Hunter does whatever the fuck Hunter does, then at that point in time, like you've got the pieces to just overwhelm people and win the game. I don't actually think they have a fantastic T-side, this team. There's so many squads I'd go with before this. Like, people might laugh at Apex. I think Apex calls a better T-side than Snacks. Also, let's just throw this out there. Maybe I'll do a video on it in the future, but I'll do it about all the coaches. I'm sick and tired of Taz cheating. So you cheated at IM Cologne. Now you're cheating here at Blast, just blatantly on camera. Like, if you don't know, by the way, I called Fallen up for this motherfuckers when I worked at E-League. I said on camera, on E-League, on fucking American TV, that he is cheating in technical timeouts. You can see him talking to his teammates about the rounds. Now, people are going like, no, he's just hyping up. You don't know what he's saying, you fucking idiot. And he's not allowed to do anything to them. You can do a fist bump, that's it. People like Taz are why people like fucking Valve were being dickheads at PGL Stockholm telling threat you can't even clap. Because they're thinking, right, if you allow these guys to give them an inch, they'll take a mile. They'll start using cords or they'll start signaling. Taz is fucking almost doing that. What on earth are you doing talking over and over and over again, you fucking cheater? You are a cheater. By the way, does that mean I don't like him? Does that mean, oh, he can't be a good coach or he wasn't a great player? No. But the fact that you like someone doesn't mean they're allowed to fucking cheat on camera. Now, I have asked someone out there, I'm going to go and research this, did Blade do it on camera? Because there might be a world where Blade did it, obviously Blade was listening to the crowd at fucking EPL, wasn't he? But if I don't find as many instances, I'm probably going to have to make a video about this topic. Because I'm sick and tired of the idea that someone who's CS royalty, and a true legend of the game, by the way, with a billion majors won, all that success, insanely long career, seemed, by the way, like a sportsman. Remember the famous time he came out and said to the crowd in Cologne, like, stop fucking booing off, my and fanatic. But then he's just cheating. Mate, and the one at Cologne was the worst one because he was even pointing to shit like straps on a piece of paper. Like, it's so egregious. It's such poor sportsmanship. This is why, by the way, all cultures aren't equal. You know, when they go, oh, don't be racist and xenophobic and say your culture is better than theirs. Yeah, I will say that a culture, my culture, English culture, is about sportsmanship. That's why in football in England, if someone gets injured in the game on the other team, you don't just go, lol. We're up fucking 11 versus 10. Dick them. They're on the ground. You kick the ball out yourself so they can get treatment. And then, assuming they're English as well, their cultural response is supposed to be to thank you by actually basically just sort of giving you the ball back. That's the fair way you do it. Other people are just like, Americans especially, just like, no, well, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. So I guess fucking Taz has got some of that American in him, Addy. See that clever way I didn't sort of flame Polish culture there. I mean, it seemed like an American thing. I know what I'm doing, mate. In the future, that's the obvious thing we need to talk about with this team. This team can win an event. It, that was obvious for me, WC. The problem is they have to get hot like this. I almost thought about Mims. This is why I'm hot. This is why I'm hot. But I do think even if they get hot, they can lose. You saw here, they could absolutely have lost to Vitality. They could have lost to Na'Vi in the final. I don't know about Spirit. Maybe Nico was dominating Donkey, in which case you're going to have a very good chance to win against them. You do historically win against FaZe. I'd like to see them thrown in again against the Team Liquid. I'd like to see them against Mouse. I'd like to see them in a best of five against Vitality, by the way. That would be fucking fire. Wouldn't you love to see G2 against Vitality with these lineups in a best of five? Imagine if that's the major final. That'd be fucking sick. I just don't really buy that this is going to be an actual favorite team that wins events regularly. I think this is a banana cop. I don't think it doesn't matter that much. I don't think that stadium compares at all to a Lanxess or Royal Arena or even the fucking one in Rio, etc. Well, it definitely doesn't compare to the one in Rio because people aren't saying they'll kill you in the crowd, are they? I think Hunter is someone where, uh, I mean, if he has tournaments like this, they won't win. They won't win. Part of what made them win before for me was they were getting up to that, like, especially the mouse Navi level, where you can sometimes have four of your players that aren't the IGL, like fragging out in big numbers. He's shown that he, he can be off his game. Malbs can be streaky. It's map to map for that guy. Not even just series to series. I don't buy the snacks calling angle. I'm not saying it's terrible. By the way, I actually thought Huxley was a good caller. He just wasn't appropriate for this team. That's why I said I wanted him in Astralis. He should still be in a top 10 team. I don't know that snacks should be calling in a top five team for me. Maybe he can be in a lower end top 10 team. And I've also heard kind of his style of calling. He needs really good players for. He can't just do it with the lesser players. Hence why in Game League, it was a little bit up and down, wasn't it? The Taz angle, we still don't know how good he is as a coach. He still seems sometimes like a cheerleader, which isn't negative, by the way. Sometimes you need a cheerleader. Sometimes that to get... Robin was the best cheerleader of all time in CSGO. That's one of the things he was fucking incredible at. What do you think people like Devil Walk did? You think they were calling the craziest strats ever? Of course they fucking weren't. 
Now, one thing I'll address is this notion that because they won a blast banana cup, Nico shouldn't leave now for Falcons, where he might be able to play, by the way, of like Magus, um, Simple, Zonic might be there, maybe they're getting other players in. Yeah, he shouldn't leave. He should stay in this like semi-scoffed, skilled, but not that structured G2 team. And what's the reason why? Because they won a blast. Shut the fuck up. Blast isn't major. It's not a prestige event. Then also, there's the whole thing that I'm so sick of. Like everyone's going, yeah, but what about him and Monacy, right? Mate, Monacy might leave and not even for Falcons. He might just go to another team. What if what if he stays and then this time Monacy's the one that just goes and eats it? What if then Monacy leaves and it's just Nico and now he doesn't have an AWPA? Imagine how fucking stupid that would be. Also, do you know another reason why Nico should leave? Because he's going to get the giga bag at Falcons, which he totally deserves. He deserves to get a massive salary. He has played such a high level for so many years and counted some bad teams as well. If you don't know, he doesn't have the most insane salary in G2. You're all just plebs. You don't know what some of the salaries in G2 and Vitality are like. If you're a Zebu, you might get a massive salary. I've heard some of them are on the craziest salary. And by the way, he didn't, despite a million of you saying so, come back to G2, renegotiate his contract, extend it and re-up. Also, by the way, can I just throw that part out there? Why is everyone making out like he's being sold? Do you know when his contract ends? Maybe that's just when the contract runs out so that there's not even a buyout. And if he's smart, by the way, if you're watching this, mate, this is how you get rich. If you're smart and there's no buyout, what you say to Falcons is, of course, I'll join you for a massive salary, one of the biggest in the world. And oh, by the way, you know the buyout, since there is no buyout, just give me 100k. There's no buyout, so I'll just have a 100k signing fee. And I'll join your team, because by the way, I've also got plenty of other fucking squads will take me as well if I want to. I bet fucking Vitality take me tomorrow. I bet a whole bunch of these teams would. So if I, I think he should do that angle. And then lastly, the reason I hate it is, look, him and Monacy do play very well together now. They didn't before. Before it was Monacy sick and Nico not so much. Then when after the play break they came back, Monacy was having some off tournaments and Nico looked like the best player in the world. Now they've got it together for a one or two tournaments. It's even sketchy. And let's be real, I'm just going to say it right now. You know the same people who go, ha, you don't understand the game, Thorne, and the deep tactical, and then your reason for why you want Nico and Monacy to stay together is, look at the way in documentaries and interviews they hug each other they're like best friends or like brothers like he's like his little brother like I can't fucking stand that because you all did it with Stown and Cadian when they were in Heroic and it turns out at the end there was massive fucking problems there and they wanted to kick each other out the team you all thought like oh look at this retreat Team Liquid is doing the right thing they are all going to become friends and then I heard they fucking hated each other or specific people in that team I'll do a video on that in the future don't even worry about it so basically you've recreated in fucking Counter-Strike Stan culture where you're shipping two people like I just love them so I want them to love each other and believe that they're best friends friends. Oh, oh, imagine if there was like an anime and then in the next scene, they were both in high school and they were like, dut, 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 dut. oh, time for maths, Monty. Hey, see you after the, see you in recess, Nico, big bro. Fucking hell. You know what? I'll say this. If you, if you're shipping fucking Monacy as Nico's little bro, I'll just say two things. One, I've heard that it's not like that behind the scenes at all. That was what it was like at the beginning period. I've heard there was actually some tension at certain points in times. Woo! Just going to put that out there. And then two, you know what? If that makes, honestly, the little bro, well, little bro don't know you and you don't know little bro. Okay? So I think G2 is a pretty good team as a dark horse right up there. They're probably a good team to bet as an underdog. I still think their map pool, put it this way, name me three maps that G2 is the best in the world on or top three on. I'll wait. Do, 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 do. Yeah, you're having a hard time, aren't you? Or if you did answer them, you're just a moron. You don't know this Counter-Strike, so it could be that too. I think, actually, this was a fire run. It was very legit in terms of the people you beat. Like, But it wasn't like a consistent thing that can be replicated. And if it is, well, hey, we're going to have the best CS set two ever, aren't we? But I don't think it is. Everyone needs a support network. And mine is, of course, my Patreon community the Scrominati, who in many ways, they're the sunny to my share, saying, I got you, babe. So this video and all the others on my channel were kindly supported by the following names. I met a Jew, Mac Pugnaccio Rakula, Adam Tomlin, Animosity, Jensen Gore, Tosh, Toucan, and you know it. Jerky's minion, my main man, always going to be referenced, one of the best patrons of all time. Would you like to ask a question in my AMA? Maybe you want to suggest a topic or a guest to see on my channel? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming Reflections and Talk to Thorin interviews are. Maybe you want to do one of those long discussions where you get to set the topics we talk about. Well, if any of these or others appeal to you, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Scaluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.